quite an experienced person with this Tesla technology. He used to work for Rockwell Automation as a technical instructor. And from 1989 to 1991, and, and I was there, and I didn't even know about this. <laughs> he was the editor of a second journal that we were publishing for a while. It was called the uh, International Tesla Society Journal of Power and Resonance. And if you have a copy of that, hang on to it, because it's now a very rare item, and I don't know where the masters might be or anything. Because uh, I never. So he was editing that, and he got a very good reputation working with that. We always knew around the old Tesla Society that he was a good guy and a guy we could count on, and that was worth a lot at that time. <clears throat> he built his first Tesla engine in 1990, and now he's working full time doing various forms of Tesla turbines and engines. So here's Jeff Hayes. Jeff Hayes. There you go. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. I'm just going to clip you on here. Sorry about that. So how many uh, people here in the audience, just to get an idea, uh, know about the Tesla turbine or anything about it? How it works, basics. How, how many people have never heard of the Tesla turbine but don't really know how it works? Okay. So we're making some progress. So a large percentage of the audience actually knows something about the turbine. Back in uh, 1993, we started the Tesla Engine Builders Association to help people out that wanted to actually build these properly. Okay. And we made great progress since then. Uh, be everybody hear me okay? Before we get started, I might ask, does anybody have uh, questions particularly about what you want, questions you might have about the turbine? And we can work them right into the lecture. Rather than wait till the end, I can ask, answer most questions. I have one question is, uh, the, what's the best way to determine the spacing of the plates? Okay, another question. How does it work? How does it work? Good question. Another question? Efficiency. Efficiency, good question. Another question? There's been some discussion lately on the internet about uh, the ability to access a turbine uh, really isn't proven compared to its ability to act as a pump. Say its ability to act as a turbine is not proven versus that of a pump. Good question. Another question? Excellent question. What speed is the best speed? Another question? I've got two of them. How, sir? How many media will it work? How, what, what media will it operate under? Good question. Another question? Can it be used with gas? Can it be used with gas? Excellent question. Are they as efficient as other turbines? As they, are they as efficient as other turbines? We'll, we'll get into that. Thank you. Next. It's function in a closed loop system. Very, very good question. Others? That's it? Come on. What happens with the temperature? Temperature. What kind of temperatures can it operate under? Good question. Where can it be bought? Where can it be bought? Another good one. Up to what pressure? What pressure? You guys are better. Yeah, you keep them coming. Anything else? Will it revolutionize the world? <laughs> Remains to be seen. That's a political question. <laughs> OK. Uh, back to the original slides. Pardon, which one? The original set. The, the turbine itself is the simplest turbine that there is in existence. Tesla considered this his greatest invention. And can you imagine that? All the things that Tesla invented, and this was his greatest invention. And here it is. It's just a simple shaft with a series of disks mounted on the shaft. It's a very simple machine. Here's the basics up on the screen. This is a pump. It can be used as a pump or as a turbine. If you rotate the shaft, 
the suction, you create suction in the center. This has a housing around it, like you see. It'll create suction in the center. It spirals around and then comes out the periphery. That's the pump. You drive the shaft if you're a pump. If you're a turbine, you put high pressure fluid in the periphery of the case. It spirals around and comes out the center. What could be simpler? I mean, there's really nothing to it. If you know that much, you know how the Tesla turbine operates. Unfortunately, it's always the simple things that tend to confound. Okay? Any questions on that? Pump, it comes in the center, it spirals around, comes out the periphery, turbine, you put high pressure fluid at the periphery, it spirals around and comes out the center. Now you're a Tesla turbine expert. <laughs> <laughs> But that's his greatest invention. He, he considered that this invention would revolutionize the world. How could something so simple and so, you know, once it's thought up, it's, it's, it seems so simple to, as to be unbelievable. How could something like that revolutionize the world? How could that be his greatest invention? Come on. But it is. And we'll see why. Okay, I'm not... Not pro I'm not sliding. Um, not progressing. There we go. There we go. Uh, this is a barcode off of a book. We've documented the entire thing in a book called Tesla's Engine. It's available out in the bookstore. This is an excellent book. It'll tell it gives you all the source information from back in Tesla's time. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that. Okay, now. Nah. Okay. So, it, it, so there is a book available. It is documented. What's going on? Hold on a second. It's got a mind of its own. Yes. There's a diagram of the turbine. Okay. You'll notice there that the turbine is a little different than the pump. And you'll see the spiral, they've in dotted lines, they represent the spirals. It comes in the nozzle, and E comes in, it spirals around, it comes out the exhaust D. Uh, this is a really neat feature of this turbine, because you can shut off the valve at E and turn, it, turn on the valve at A. Turn on the valve at A, turn this valve off, turn that valve on, what's going to happen? Reverse. You got reverse or a break. It's the only turbine that you can mechanically reverse. All other turbines can't do that because if you tried to do that with a, with a bladed turbine, which has, instead of has in discs, you have cupped blades inside, what's the problem? You're going to hit the back side of the blade, right? So that's, you can't do that in a normal turbine. So that's a, that's a nice feature on this turbine, it's reversible. Next. Yeah, next one. Okay, uh, right here, this is how it was going to revolutionize the, the world. This is Tesla's geothermal, and one of the questions was, can it be used in a closed loop? Well, here's a closed loop. Here you have the turbine. Oh, well, this is actually, a, this is an actually, this is a C system. Uh, wish we had more control over the slides, but in this example, Tesla talked about using the temperature dif differential of the ocean. You bring up cold, uh, you bring in water up into the, con in, into the unit, and, a, and a war, here warm, warm comes in on the boiler, and you have cold coming into the condenser, and you have a temperature differential condenser to boiler that operates through the turbine. So just like any other power plant, you have a heat source, and you have a condenser. If you've ever gone past the power plant, you'll notice there's steam coming off of the condensers. This, this, the power source of fuel is typically natural gas or coal. Well, instead of using coal or natural gas, you can get environmentally derived energy. So it can be used in, as, a, as a sea power plant, and he also had a scheme to use geothermal power. 
Now you notice there's a vacuum pump here. This can also be used as a, in the pumping mode. Remember, you suck in the center, you go out the periphery, it's a pump. Well, you can use it to create a high vacuum. Tesla had patents on how to create a high vacuum. So whenever you draw a high vacuum on a fluid, what happens to that fluid? It boils, right? So you can actually turn a low temperature fluid into steam. You can make it ebullite at almost any temperature by applying a, a high enough, strong enough vacuum. So that's what happens. You apply a vacuum and you make steam and the steam goes into the turbine. The turbine is driven by the steam and then you generate power on the Tesla generator. And that's what Tesla is known for in our power plants. All of our power plants use this section right here. You go to any power plant in the U.S. and you'll see these Tesla three-phase alternators. That's standard equipment. Well, Tesla revolutionized the power system with this device. Trouble is, the, where we've really fallen down, is we haven't used this. And that's key to getting clean energy. And st because this a device allows you to recover in, uh, uh, environmental energy, which we have tremendous amount of, of environmental energy is available to us. Now, this system shows it being used with a condenser, but there is other systems where you can, where you can recover salt brine. Rather than using clean steam to go onto the device, you can use dirty steam. You can use steam that contains solids. Why do you think that's important? I mean, all of our geothermal activity right now is just a minuscule amount of geothermals being used today. Why is that? Why aren't we taking advantage of this huge potential of, ge of geopower that we have that's clean? I mean, the Earth is, uh, is a nuclear device, right? We're sitting on top of a tremendous amount of clean energy. It's already there. You look at the volcanoes, you look at the ring of fire, there's a tremendous amount of power there, right? And the earth is expanding and heating. Wouldn't it make sense to use some of that rather than to burn more fuel and inc increase the problems? That was Tesla's goal, and that's why he called this his greatest invention. Because there happens to be something, why, I asked the question, why aren't we using more geothermal? Can anybody give me an answer? Pardon? More money the other way? Well, there is vested interest in fuels, but there are some of the biggest players that have been trying to get into geothermal, and they have technical limitations. It's very corrosive. It's very corrosive. Most of our geothermal that we have today is what they call salt brine geothermal. We're literally flooded in this dirty geothermal that comes right out of the ground like a gushing oil well. You can drill a hole, and out comes a huge, high-pressure stream of steam. But there's only one problem with it. It's completely contaminated. It can contain up to 80% solids. Okay? No turbine can handle that. So as a result of that problem, they have to use what's called a combined, or a, it's a combined cycle system where they have to take the dirty fluid out, put it through a heat exchanger, then take a clean fluid, exchange the heat, and then drive the turbine with the clean fluid. But that's very inefficient, and that has limited the development of geothermal. Right now in Southern California, in the Salton Sea, I don't know if you, some of you may be familiar with the Salton Sea down near Los Angeles. They're doing some geothermal reclamation there now. It's one of the hottest places for geothermal, one of the hotter spots for geothermal in the country. But it's 80% solids. What percentage of the energy needs of this country do you think could be supplied by the Salton Sea? Anybody have a, a knowledge on that? what the estimates are, easily recoverable geothermal power from the Salton Sea, how much of a percentage of our energy needs could that take care of? 20%. 20%? All of it. All of it. That's the, that's the correct answer. Actually, there's 27 times as much power as we need in Southern California alone, just in the Salton Sea. And it's recoverable using this technology. So now you know why Tesla called this his greatest invention. The energy problem is solved. Right now, it's a, it's a tremendous problem of ignorance. And that's what's holding us back, believe it or not. It's not so much that it's, 
that there's this massive conspiracy to prevent new things, it's primarily ignorance. The turbine bladed engineers that have looked at this, they have their whole life invested in bladed turbines, and here you come along with a simple turbine that puts all their training and knowledge to naught, and they do not react very kindly to it. And the tests that have been done on this turbine, this turbine must be operated properly. Even though it is very, very simple, if it's not operated properly, it will completely fail your tests if you don't know what you're doing. And it's a, and the very simple things, and that's where people screw up on. So all the tests that have been performed to date, except for a few of the recent ones which we've sponsored, have failed. And as a result of that, the Department of Energy declares that this is an unworkable technology, but it's completely misinformed. Any other questions? Why does the corrosiveness of the, of the uh, steam uh, interfere with the operation of the tester? The question is, why doesn't the corrosiveness of the steam interfere? Is it, is it possible for me to? Okay, here, no, go back. Here is a behavior of steam. Why, why can this turbine operate? Well, most turbines have to be operated up in, up in the region E, superheated vapor. If you put so much as a drop of water, if you're down in the saturated vapor range, if you put so much as a drop of water in that turbine, that turbine turns into junk because that drop of water is like a bullet and goes right through the blade. Okay? The Tesla turbine is the only turbine, get this, the only turbine that you don't have to worry about temperature regulation. On a standard conventional turbine, temperature regulation is critical. If you don't have your temperature regulation in check, you could go through a mil millions of dollars. Because if so much as droplets of water form inside your turbine, it's trash. And that's expensive when you got these big turbines operating. So you got to imagine how critical and how worried they are about temperature regulation and how much cost that adds to a turbine system. That goes away with this. In the Tesla turbine, you can operate, you can operate with, in a saturated vapor region. You can operate in, in the two-phase region where you're, you have water and steam. You can operate in a saturated liquid where you have almost no steam but mostly just very hot liquid. You can operate on subcooled liquid and, and put high pressure water right to the device without damage. So it can operate in all five phases of, this, of, the, of the steam behavior characteristic and, and it can inject solids. You can put solids, not just droplets, but solids. And that's the same reason you can put solids is, is the same reason you can put water through it. Because nothing actually, there's nothing to contact. As you, put, as you put fluid into these discs, it, nothing actually is to abrade the disc. It works by adhesion and viscosity. Those are the two concepts. You notice if I dribble some water on this disc, some of it ran right off, but you'll notice there's, a, there's still a cohesive drop on there, and what's it doing? It's sticking. That's adhesion. Okay, that's the two kind. It works by, you notice how it clumped together to itself. That's viscosity. And it clung, clings to the disc. There's still water droplets on there clinging. That's, a, that's adhesion. So between those two concepts of adhesion and viscosity, you have torque transfer. It's not done through reaction on a blade. And that's why you can pump solids. Or you can pump solids or you can drive and operate with solids in the fluid. Um, you've said that the salt and sea area can provide 27 times our energy needs. That's been some estimates, yeah. yeah now are uh, 20, the salt and sea has 20 sometimes potential. And I've and heard. You could use a Tesla term to extract this. Are, are there any other areas in the United States that would be similar? It's the question is, is there any other areas in, in the US? For the benefit of the recording, could you repeat the question? Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm doing that right now. Uh, yeah, the, the question is, is there, other, is there other sites with so much potential as a salt and sea? Yes, they're all over the world. So, yes, everyone, every country has the potential to meet their own energy How about the needs. Great salt lake? Pardon? How about the Great Salt Lake? Does that have a lot of potential in terms of salt and sea? I, well, it probably has some. 
I know that the Great Salt Lake, when it was overflowing its borders, they used this technology to actually lower the lake level because it was the only pump that could stand up to the salt in the water. What about mineral buildup in it? What about mineral buildup? Well, that's, a good, that's a good question. Uh, the the, the uh, tests that were, or the, uh, the Salt Lake pumping experiment, they actually put a, a grease mark pencil on, they took one of the discs and took a grease pencil and they made a mark on the disc. And then they ran the thing for days and days pumping away, and then when they were finished, they disassembled the, the pump, and there was no mineral buildup, and the grease mark pencil was clearly visible just as if you had just made the mark. So that tells you something that there is absolutely no wear inside these devices. What is it? Where are the discs came from? This one's aluminum. They could be made out of just about any material, plastic, but in, in uh, corrosive service, you'd, you'd want to use a metal that's not going to be eaten up by, if like you're pumping an acid, you want to have some stainless, stainless or inconel, some high-end material, such that if you have material left in the pump, it doesn't, because it, it, it will abrade the discs. If you have a corrosive and you don't have the right material, it will eat away the discs. Oh, here's the, the different role for, the, there's, there's actually tie pins that hold these discs together. There's two methods you can use to construct the turbine. You can either have the shaft method, what we have here, or you can use with the overhung method where you just have the center open. And in the, when you use the overhung method, you have just a single back plate and you, you bolt all the discs to the back plate through the holes. That makes construction a little bit easier but there's advantages and disadvantages of doing it each way. Are there any advantages to the small holes and the one with the shaft in the middle around the periphery? Yes, this is, this is out of a pump. This is a, a, a turbine. Actually, there's too many tie pins in here. The guy that did this got kind of carried away. That's not the spec. Actually, there should only be about one-third as many tie pins. Okay, and, they're and they're what they're doing is they're maintaining the spacing. There's washers between them. So you have a, a rivet, a washer, a disc, a washer. So all these discs are actually separated by washers that are on the rivet or the tie pin. Is this a private company that's doing this? Is there a private company that's doing that? No, we're, the Tesla Engine Builders Association is a 501c3 nonprofit. So we haven't gotten a lot of, you'd think that we'd have tremendous support. You know, this is, a, this is an energy answer, and all this crisis about global warming, you think that there would be overwhelming support for this, but all we have is our membership. We've never received a grant. We've never received any interest from the Department of Energy. Their attitude is it doesn't work. Even though the Department of Energy facility, uh, the environmental research lab in, in Dakota, used to be run by the Department of Energy. They, two years ago, they tested this turbine. This is actually a program from uh, the, the California Energy Commission put up $75,000 to test the turbine. And one of the researchers there collected the money. They were, ended up, after their initial overhead, they ended up with $50,000 that they could spend on the testing. And they actually did a pretty good test and they didn't have a turbine, though. They have no clue of how to build a turbine. So one of our members, we got them a test turbine, and we, which is uh, built by John Picard, one of our early members. And we got it set up at the, uh, the test lab. And they, they, they wanted to see if it could burn biomass. Their interest was in biomass. Is any, everybody familiar with what biomass is? Biomass is when you burn like oats or corn or switchgrass, and you make heat. They wanted to know if, if, they, could, they, if they could burn biogas directly through the turbine. Now, normally the way you do biofuels is you heat them up and you make steam in a boiler, then the steam drives the turbine. Well, they wanted to know, could we bypass that and burn biomass directly into the turbine? Okay. Problem is, with most turbines, can you do that with a normal turbine? Can you just go ahead and burn biomass and put the combustion products directly through the turbine? Oh, you can't do that because they contain solids. And what do the solids do to bladed turbines? It destroys them. So 
I gave a talk at the first annual Telluride Tech Fest and generated some interest, so word got out that this technology was available, and, and California Energy Commission gave a grant, and we actually did get it tested. What do you think the results of those tests were? Uh, those, those tests, you think it was a failure or a, a wonderful success? <laughs> it, was a, it was an unprecedented success, which, which blows my mind. This is over two years ago now. They've tested this and found out that everything we're saying is true, and yet still no continued interest in it. The same old attitudes seem to prevail. But hopefully that's changing. It takes time to, for new ideas. Even though this is the 100th anniversary, and this is a special year, in 1906, the first model was built. So this is the first anniversary, 100-year anniversary. Question? Can you describe in a little more detail exactly how the turbine operates on the principles of viscosity and adhesion? OK, more detail on how it actually works. Hey, which uh, slide would you like? I can't control. This one, this one? Okay. right there. OK, here's a diagram of the of working fluid on a turbine, or, or a pump for that matter. The turbine, you come in at the periphery with hot, you have a nozzle. And we have, two, we have two devices out in the lobby that you can go and look at and look at exactly how they're constructed. You have a nozzle, which is spraying your hot fluid onto the periphery of the disc. That's represented by the stream coming in. It comes in and it spirals around and then comes out the exhaust. Can you point to the, what's the electric? Okay, what do you want to, what do you want me to point at? What you're describing the spiral. Okay, here we cut the fluid coming in. So it's essentially it's kind of dizzy. The metal. Out the center. And the reason this and some, one of the initial questions was efficiency. Is this turbine efficient? Everyone says it's terribly inefficient. Why do they say that? Well, because they, they've never run it properly. When t this turbine happens to be the most efficient turbine in its class. It was documented as, as such back in 1911. They did extensive testing. Yale University was involved. Tesla had his original models tested. And it was sworn in the court record that this turbine was the highest conversion efficiency of any known type turbine. And that still is the case today. A single stage turbine, a turbine meaning just having one section, one stage, can, can give you a conversion efficiency, an isotropic, what they call isotropic conversion efficiency, meaning fluid energy in versus shaft energy out of 55%. Okay? A standard coal power plant with a multiple, multiple, multiple stage turbine not just a little single stage device like this, they get about 70% conversion efficiency. So you can see, in a simple little device, you're getting 55%, and there's ways to bring it even higher, which we'll talk about. But just to building a simple device, you're already up to 55% conversion efficiency. So let me finish this one point. And the pump, you're just the opposite. On the pump, you drive the shaft. Instead of the fluid driving the shaft, you actually put a motor on here and you make a turn, okay? As you make a turn, what happens? Just the opposite. Fluid sucked in the center, and then you have the opposite effect. It spirals and comes out as high pressure fluid. And guess what? These pumps can pump solids. And the oil industry, believe it or not, is standardized on this technology. They have actually adopted the pumping, and it's acknowledged to be the finest pump in the world for any money, and as a result, they charge big money. There's one company that is making them. I'll pick up the question quick here. Yeah, okay. So the, the fluid, it spirals inward, then it, goes out the center. It, only on the turbine, right. Yeah, if, you're, turbine. if you have high pressure fluid flow and you're driving a shaft, it spirals around and comes out the center. I, this, I didn't see any entrance uh, ports. Uh, how does the fluid enter into that? Oh, here's the entrance port right here. See it? Center? That's the black, is the center here. Well, you, you showed something on the periphery, on the outside. Right, there's a casing around here. This has got a casing around it. Yeah. 
It's not just out in the open like this, but it sucks in the center, comes in the spirals of disc, and comes out the periphery into a standard diffuser. No, no need for that. This is just plain discs. Is, is there a this is all it is. Don't overcomplicate it. That's where people get into trouble. In, in that thing, is there a spiral uh, channels in there? Or no, it just happens by, you know how the, you look up at the Milky Way, and you notice we're one of the great arms of the spiral? That's happening naturally. This is a vortex turbine, like a tornado. This is a na it always finds its best place to be. And the faster you run it, the tighter the spiral gets. And as, the, and as you get the tighter spiral, you have more disks contact with the steam. And what happens to the efficiency? Goes up. So the faster you run these, the higher the efficiency. And one of the biggest problems in doing testing is they never get it to its rated speed. And this turbine is very unique amongst turbines, is it does not produce any significant power until you reach its operating speed. Or what is the typical RPM capacity? It depends, the, the RPM depends on the diameter. Something that's like this, would, you'd want to run around 30,000 RPM. But if you run it at 20,000 RPM, it might seem like it's going at tremendous speed, but it won't produce any power. Okay, because what happens is, instead of having a nice spiral, what happens is you just get the slippage. It goes right into the, it takes, boom. And, to, and so when you go boom right to the exhaust, you're not going to get any interaction and no power. But a, a conventional turbine doesn't operate like that. And conventional en engineers, they don't understand that. So when they do their tests, they're completely confounded. Everything they've been taught about doesn't apply to this. A question? So when you're saying it's spiraling, it's actually streams of water which are clinging to the metal because of the adhesion? Adhesion and viscosity, like we showed with the water, right? And it's, and the faster you turn it, the tighter the spirals, the more interaction, the higher the efficiency. Matter of fact, Dr. Warren Rice of the University of Arizona did extensive testing on this technology, and he claims that the efficiency can be as high as 97% under his testing. But Tesla claimed 98% or even higher. So you can reach, you can almost reach 100% efficiency with this. But I said they tested them at 55. Why, if they can go to 100, don't you go to 100? Why, why do you settle for 55? What's the problem with going up to those higher efficiencies? No? No, that's not, the explosion of the disc, that's not a problem. Pardon? Materials are not a problem. Why is it that you can get this really high efficiency? But the problem is, at those very high efficiency numbers, you won't have power. Because power is a function of the differential of the fluid coming in, its pressure, versus the speed of the disks. That differential is what gives you the power, okay? If you have the stream coming in and the disk going the same speed as the stream coming in, are you going to generate any power? No. That's why it's not practical to go to 100% or 90-some percent efficiency. There are ways to boost it higher by recuperation, but a single stage is limited to about 55% mechanical or isotropic efficiency, which is a tremendously high number. No other bladed turbine can do that in a single stage. They have multiple, multiple stages. If you stage this turbine, it will get, it'll have the efficiency up there with the best of them, better than any bladed turbine. When you say the faster you turn it, that's in the pump mode. The faster you turn it, it applies both ways. The faster you turn it as a pump, the better. If you're running it you'll have higher pressure, more flow. If the faster you turn it as a turbine, you'll have, you'll have higher efficiencies, more power. How do you change the speed when it's in the turbine mode? How do you change the speed when it's in the turbine mode? Yeah. Well, there's two ways. You can either reduce your load or you can increase your fuel pressure. The input pressure. Input pressure. Yeah, bladed turbines are amazingly efficient, but the Tesla turbine can match their efficiency. And the thing is, if you can match the efficiency of a bladed device without all the disadvantages of the bladed device, 
They can be put into applications that could never be used with the bladed turbine. And that's the benefit. Not so much that the Tesla turbine is going to change the efficiency because they've already got efficiencies up to what the Tesla turbine can do. You're right. But if you look at a, if you look at a conventional power plant, like a coal plant, you look at their total efficiency of the turbine, it's only about 70%. No, I'm not even talking about the losses that are associated with the generators. You, cycle efficiency is around. Yeah, the cycle efficiency is no higher than 35% if you're you honest about it in a, in a coal power plant. You wouldn't get that any different here unless you got another cycle. You, you, you have to, good point. This would not be any more efficient than a bladed turbine operated the way that they operated bladed turbines today. But do you realize that we do have a, not just our standard coal plants, which are 35% thermally efficient, we have a better technology now. Does anybody know what that is? We raised our power plant efficiency above 35%? Combined cycle gas turbine, exactly. Do you know who patented the combined cycle gas turbine in 1927? Nikola Tesla. Okay, so the, the highest Technology, the highest efficiency we have today for bladed turbines was patented by Nikola Tesla. And he specifically, he specifically specced blades, okay? He said, this is the way, if you guys are gonna insist on blades, you wanna make them efficient, this is how you do bladed turbines efficiently. But guess what, guys? You're misdirected. You shouldn't be using blades. This is, and we can use the same techniques to make the Tesla turbine just as efficient, okay? But there's an advantage when you use the Tesla turbine in a combined cycle power plant. In a combined cycle power plant, you have a standard steam generator. Well, you, have, you actually have a gas turbine. It has a compressor, has a, a burner, it has a turbine, it has a generator, okay? What's different? That's, that's like a standard gas turbine. But what they do with, they take the waste heat, that's the key. They take the waste heat out of the turbine and what do they do with it? They boil water with it, and then they, what do they do? Put it into a secondary steam turbine. So now you have a gas turbine. Its waste heat is taken out and applied to a steam turbine. That's called combined cycle. Okay, they can get the efficiencies up to 60% in the lab. It's about 50 to 55% in the field. Very high efficiency. Okay, in Tesla's patent, he specified that method for bladed turbines. But then he, he also specified in the same turbine patent, which if you want to see it, it's on our website, teslaengine.org. That patent is posted. Tesla patents combined cycle recuperation and related links, you'll find it. But Tesla did not specify a separate steam turbine. What do you think Tesla did in that specification? Rather than have a separate steam turbine, which is required if you're using blades, in that same patent, he specified using the same gas turbine, okay? So you have a gas turbine, you have waste heat generated, you have a steam boiler, the steam boiler drives another turbine, right? Well, in the Tesla scheme, you take that steam out, and instead of putting it to another turbine, you bring it back in and you apply it to the same turbine. You put it in your gas turbine. As a matter of fact, you use that steam to moderate the temperatures that you're applying to the gas turbine, okay? So what have you just done to the cost of making a combined cycle system? You've slashed it in half, okay? We're not doing that today. All of our power plants, would, which acknowledge Tesla's patent, they are using the system, it works, they don't realize they're using the Tesla patent, but it works, but they do not understand the other half. And this is no conspiracy, they're trying to get as efficiency they're trying to do it as efficient as they can. They're using all the techniques they're aware of. Nothing's been hidden. Nothing's been covered up. But they just don't know. And it's a sad state of affairs. And that's why that's your, all of your job is to become educators, because I can't do it alone. And we, maybe we can change some things, because it's not a conspiracy. The well, question is if we textured the disc, a lot of people have asked that. If you put, if you put uh, like a golf ball, golf ball pattern on the disc, wouldn't, or, or sand them, roughen them up, would that improve the operation or make the operation 
worse. What should we do instead? We don't want to roughen. We want to polish. We want to polish surface. Well, why is that? Well, if you go back to the water example, I dribble some water on here, and the water's sticking. If you roughen that disc, would the water stick like that? No, it would, it would not adhere. You'd break the adhesion. It's self-defeating to do that. A lot of people have tried it. They, they think intuitively that's the way to go, but it isn't. And they found this has not been intuitive to most engineers. Matter of fact, in, in performance race cars and the intake manifolds, they used to make the intake manifolds polished. Guess what they do now? They roughen them because they found out po polishing an intake manual actually restricts airflow. If you roughen the surface, you get better flow. A question. Does the spacing between the plates depend on the viscosity of your paint solution? The question is, does the spacing between the discs, is that affected by viscosity? Yes, completely. If you, if you want to run a high viscous fluid in the pump, you can take the discs apart. Matter of fact, as the, as the viscosity of the fluid goes up, the efficiency increases. Another question? How many discs can you stack together to determine your turbine size? Can you go up to the gigawatt size? Yes. There's no, there's not, there's no limiting factors. But the nice thing about this is it can be built modularly. Rather than build these huge monolith turbines that we have today, that if they do get water inside them and they go down, it's a multi-million dollar affair, plus you, a large section of your power generation is now unavailable because we have these massive central stations. Well, you could still have massive central stations if that was your desire, but you could modular, modularize. Instead of having one big, huge turbine, these things are so cheap and easy that you can, now you have sections of turbines. And if there does happen to be a problem with the bearings or whatever in one, or you want to do maintenance, you don't take your whole power plant down. You said there's one washer disc that's between each disc. How much spacing is there between the outer disc and the housing that holds the whole thing together? Okay, the, the question is, is there, he says there's washers between each one of these discs. What's the spacing between the housing and the, and the discs? It's not critical. It's uh, close, you know, sixteenth of an inch, you know, something it's fairly snug, but it's, there's no critical dimension. As, as Tesla said, there is no critical dimensions, which means that lowers the cost. Is that also corresponding to the viscosity of the Roughly, but generally you want to have the housing as close as possible so it doesn't rub. Yeah, these, this, this is a poor example. This is just a member that did this and, and gave me it. So I, but in actuality, you go and look at the actual turbine. There's a 21 inch turbine out in the lobby. Go and look at that, and you'll see how it should actually be. There's no, it, the casing comes right against, very close. It's maybe a 30 thousandths. Other question? Yeah. How would I go about persuading the Department of Energy to shift its policy? And also, what are other applications? That's the question. Well, I've, I've been kind of the lone ranger on this. I've been promoting this technology since 1989. And I do what I can. But how do we shift the paradigm? I think it's through education. It's events like this, it's, it's people like you. You're really the answer. Right, I'm, I'm, I'm familiar, but you know what the problem is when these alternative energy groups is, is, is it seems that they're really not interested in the solution. That's been my conclusion. And the, pro the problem is not, this, it's not just in the conventional energy people. It's also in the alternative energy people. Everyone's after their own quest. I call it the questers. They, they're more interested in the journey than arriving at the solution. So, 
That? Before you jump to conclusions. Okay, we'll, we'll talk later. I'm, I'm not saying it's across the board, but it seems like a, a turbine, a Monday turbine, Honda, what about the free energy from space, you know, or whatever, although Tesla wasn't a cosmic ray power, and that probably has a lot of potential too, but we have the answer. We have the complete answer that we need to solve our problem. And, and to ignore it, and they keep having conferences and talk about more and more esoteric things as our problem becomes worse and worse, seems like it, we're, we're just spinning our wheels. Is the question is, why do you think this is going to have the uh, energy answer when it has the same efficiency as a bladed turbine? Because bladed turbines cannot be applied to recover geothermal energy the way this can be applied. That's why the oil companies have all switched. In the mid-80s, the oil companies did not discover this technology until the mid-80s. It went from 1911, when it was in the front pages of the papers, and took until the 1980s before, these, before industry caught on. And it was not because of a conspiracy. It was because of pure and simple ignorance. And that's what we're up against. We're, why wasn't it used between 1911 and why, why was it the solution? Why was it declared a quantum leap for pumping in 1980? 1985, it's because of the same reason. That's why it's a solution. You go and ask the oil company if they'll give up their Tesla pump, and there's no way they'll go back. They, were go they have applications where they have to replace the pump out daily. It was costing them millions of dollars in pumps. They put one of these pumps in service, and it stays in service. They don't touch it. That's why it's a solution. They have to, you know, we have, that proves the solution. All we have to do is use the other half of the equation, and it's a similar answer. And it's not because of a conspiracy. All we have to do is start implementing this technology. They've done it for pumps. They catch on. They'll do it for turbines. And all this talk about conspiracy, yeah, they're making oil, they're, and they're starting wars to control oil. But they're doing the wars to keep the, keep the amount of energy off the market. Those, it's not about peak oil. It has nothing to do with peak oil. We are going to war to control the oil, just like the diamond industry is controlled, to keep the supply down, to keep the price up. That's the only reason. <laughs> okay. Technical question? Technical question? What is the diameter of the nozzle versus the disc stack? Well, if you have a lot of discs, what do you got to do with the nozzle? You have a big, wide nozzle, right? That's well, that might not be a nozzle, but... Well, it's, it's a slot, okay? And there's a variable nozzle. You can either open it up, make the slot bigger, or make the slot smaller. Do you have the membership manual? Uh, MEMAM2? And we can take a look at the construction. I've got all, it's kind of frustrating not to be able to get to my photographs. But if, if you purchase the book, which I highly recommend, there's all kinds of photographs, drawings, explanations. You can, you can, here's the commercial pumps. It's all in here. The slide with the curve, could you put that back up, Wes, please? Which one? The, the, the one with the curve. Okay, here it is. Well, uh, well that's. Oh, he wants the curve. The spiral? Okay. No, not the spiral. The one with the. the there. Which one did you want? I don't, so, this one, this one. Okay. The one there, there you go. That's the pump. No? Okay. That's, you notice the pump? The only difference between the pump and the turbine is the housing and the way that this center geometry is made. This actually isn't quite right. But that's how the housing should be made in a pump. A matter of fact, the commercial pumps that they build, they have not built them to test the spec. Okay. Here, here in the turbine, you talked about the nozzle. Here's the variable nozzle. This is a nozzle insert. It's a wedge. So if you pull this wedge out, you'll get bigger, more fluid flow. You push the wedge in, you'll get uh, more pressure. And it's important that you have the right pressure because pressure corresponds to what? Speed. And if you don't get speed, we know about this. This is a, this is a unique turbine. It needs its speed, right? If you try to operate it below its rating, you'll have a failure. Okay, so you have to have that nozzle adjusted properly or you won't get your speed. If you don't get your speed, you won't get your performance. Question? I noticed that I've, I've 
heard that in uh, Scandinavian countries they're using a lot of geothermal produced electricity. In some countries are using it quite a bit. All right, Iceland is. His question was, what about geothermal in other countries? Iceland's a good example. Are they using any of that technology there? No, they're not using any of this, but this would reduce their costs. You know, geothermal is already practical. They're using it in places in, like Iceland that has lots of geothermal. This technology will slash their costs in half. Question. Does the pump have to be run at the same speed as a turbine? No, the, the pumps can run much slower than the turbine because they are running higher viscosity fluids, typically like water has a high viscosity or oil has a higher viscosity, so they don't have to run. The commercial pumps run at a, anywhere from 1150 up to 3600 RPM. This is an 8 inch, I think it is. It would run around 25,000, 30,000 RPM. Okay, if we, what would you like to see? if you take a look at the pump, here's one of the commercial pumping rotors. And you'll notice that they've compromised the pump. They don't have the central geometry. Tesla actually put another uh, Archimel Archimel uh, spiral inside the pump. They've eliminated that, which is dec decreases efficiency. But they're pretty good pumps. Even so, they have them compromised. There, there should be, this is the mem manual? No, mem manual. I'll show you the commercial ones. We've got pictures of the commercial units. There's Tesla. You can use your page up, page down. Okay, this is our membership manual. If you join our organization, which is $35, you get a membership manual, which is this. And it has a bunch of information. Here's a, here's a subsidiary of Shell Oil. They started a subsidiary called Begemann Pump Pen. And this is really excellent pumping. It's all plastic. This whole thing has plastic. The only place, part that's metal is the bearings. Bearing here, a bearing here. Everything else is plastic. It's for explosive environments. Finest pump you can buy for any money. And these are big pumps. And you can go over and pick them up with one finger. They're so light. Uh, Begemann Pump Pen. There's another, there's another outfit in the U.S. that makes them as well. The other, there was a, uh, another question that I kind of glossed over about other applications. Remind me, to, we'll get back to page 12 here. But I'll show you the commercial pumps. There we go. So there's a lot in the membership manual. This is part one. It comes in two sections. Here we go. This pump saves $57,000 per year in high viscosity waste service. This was Texaco. This was from the mid 80s. So those numbers would be much higher now. But this was written up in chemical engineering where you have commercialized pumps for the first time. It was big news when it happened. And it goes on to say how these pumps will pump with nothing else and survive where nothing else would survive. This is uh, chemical processing. So it was mainstream. No conspiracy there. OK, here's a picture of Tesla's testine, where he actually established these efficiency numbers back in 1911. He's done more expensive testing than anyone has done. Tesla, when he introduced his AC polyphase system, you might have heard of the War of the Currents, the Battle of the Currents, where he fought Edison over, was it going to be DC? Was it going to be AC, the famous battle? between GE and Westinghouse, and Westinghouse won because Westinghouse had purchased the Tesla patents. Well, Tesla had been through that experience, and when he came to build his turbine, he knew that he was going to be severely criticized. People would say it wasn't real, just like they did with his AC system. It would all have to be proven. Everyone would have to have every base and every I and every T would have to be crossed or he was not going to get acceptance. So to counter that problem, he did extensive testing before he ever introduced them to the public. Remember I said this is the 100th year anniversary, 1906. It wasn't announced to the public till 1911. They spent that intervening time completely testing and verifying these turbines would do what they said they would do. So you didn't have any naysayers be able to shoot it down like they tried to do with the AC system. Okay, 
So here you have one turbine here and you have another turbine here. They're 18 inches in diameter and they have, uh, I think it's 23 discs in each one. 29 discs. 29 discs. It's in the, that's in the verbiage. They ran at 125 pounds of pressure, 9,000 revolutions per minute. Okay? And just at 9,000 revolutions per minute, at only 125 PSI at the nozzle, they achieved a 55% mechanical conversion efficiency. And they measured 38 pounds of saturated steam per horsepower hour, the highest efficiency of any other known device. Okay, they, so they ran one turbine clockwise, other turbine counterclockwise, and there's a spring in between. You see that spring? So you can actually, as the turbines run at full speed, they, they, they operate against each other, and you can actually torque that spring and, de and determine maximum horsepower, or what they call brake horsepower, which was achieved 330 brake horsepower on this outfit. And that horsepower was not limited by the turbines themselves. Well, Tesla said it was due to the strength of the case casing. You see where they're bolted here? If you run more power, you'll actually rip those bolts right out of the cast housings. That was the limitation on power. So they derated these to 200 because he got real nervous running at the high power when he demonstrated it because he was afraid it was going to rip right off the frame. So they demonstrated it at 200 horsepower, but it did achieve 330, but he got scared when he saw the frame start to go. So it was extensively tested. Questions on that? Uh, yes. Yes. As a matter of fact, Tesla wrote an article. It's written up. The question was, could you reverse these on a ship and use it to reverse prop? Okay. Thanks. The, the answer is correct. You can use one valve, like we said, and then you close that one, you open that one, you reverse, right? Tesla wrote an article, which is in one of our back issues, called uh, Electric Drive for Battleships where Tesla talked all about using electric hybrid drives for battleships and how you could use the reversing feature even if you were direct connected to the prop. That was one of the biggest problems in the shipyard was reversing. It was one of the biggest. They always had to have an auxiliary engine for reversing. This eliminates that problem. Okay, let's move on. Okay, here's the, ge here's the geothermal. We, show, we saw the ocean power scheme. Here's the geothermal scheme. You'll notice here's the, the standard AC generator that's standard today. Here's the turbine, which we aren't using. So this is the half we have to promote if we're going to get clean energy. You'll notice here that there's a deep shaft. On the bottom of the shaft, there's a boiler. You have water, which turns to steam. Okay? Even if that's not up at 212 degrees to turn into steam, how can we turn it into steam if it's low temperature? Let's say we're at one 80. We could, if we do reduce the pressure, or in other words, we put a vacuum here, we can, we can boil at lower temperatures, right? So we don't have to go down to we hit 212 degrees, right? We can simply go down far enough to get a good heat transfer, and then we can put a vacuum on it. Here's the vacuum pump, the Tesla vacuum pump. There's an AC motor driving a bladeless vacuum pump, which is patented. That draws a of suction, we boil at low temperature, steam comes up, drives the turbine, and it goes out to a condenser. So there you have geothermal power. And Tesla said it's practically inexhaustible, it's cut off there, but here's what he says, practically inexhaustible. Okay. And this isn't even the good, this is, just, this is the clean system. You notice we're, we're, we got a closed loop system here. Water comes in, turns to steam, comes up through, goes to the condenser, comes back as water, and then here you see it's dripped back in. So it's all clean. So actually a conventional turbine could actually be used in this application as well, and we are. We are using conventional turbines for geothermal. But what, what really makes this thing shine is that it can be used with dirty sources. 
because there are sources, you just put the shaft down, and what comes right out of the shaft is high pressure salt brine geothermal. And that's what we can tap with this turbine. Question? How does the vacuum work uh, to produce the steam when you're running your turbine under pressure? Well, the, the steam, the, the question is how does the vacuum create steam? Where's the vacuum applied that you still apply pressure to oh. the input side on the turbine? Oh, if there's a shaft within a shaft, you notice? Here's a shaft coming up. I think the question is about the differential of pressures. If you have a vacuum, you lower the pressure. And to create steam, which gains you a tremendous amount of more pressure. Right. Well, it is physically possible. Yeah, you can apply the vacuum and you get the steam, and the steam will come up even though there's a vacuum applied. It does work. Well, the vacuum occurs at the boiler. It's a suction. Because if you can increase the pressure, then the temperature will go up if you squeeze it. But the, 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 uh, the steam is actually being generated. Well, a good example is a pump. Uh, the, the pump, when you pump, this is why the oil industry loves these as pumps. Because when you draw a vacuum and you're running the, the, the uh, the pump, you're providing, you're pr producing pressure, but at the input, you're, you're tr creating a vacuum, right? It's like a vacuum cleaner. You're sucking in with the vacuum, but you still have power going out the device. The vacuum is created on the input, and that causes the fluid to boil and form bubbles. You actually get vapor bubbles. Even though you have high pressure coming out the pump, there's vapor bubbles that are actually on the input side, are, are vacuum bubbles. You're lowering the pressure on the, on the input side, even though it's a high pressure on the output side. So physically, these things can work. I'm not an expert on, on boilers, Question but The question is, a conventional turbine operates by the Rankine cycle. Does the same cycle apply to these devices? Yeah, they, they operate under the exact identical thermodynamics of a conventional turbine. The Carnot cycle, everything that you would apply to a normal thermodynamics model is also applicable here. The nothing, physics doesn't change. I mean, people like to, they just don't, the physics has changed simply in the, in the degree that there is no longer a limiting factor called blades. But thermodynamically, the, the concepts are identical. That's why it has so, so much legitimacy. You're not trying to rewrite physics or come up with a new paradigm in physics like a lot of these free energy researchers are, and they're not accepted. This is the same old paradigm. The only paradigm we're changing is that there isn't any blades with all their disadvantages. Are there enough uh, geothermal sites around the country? Are there enough geothermal sites around the country? Yeah. There's, there's all kinds of them. The problem is we have like the, in California, there's the geysers, which is the largest. I've visited on site there. But the problem with the geysers is that it, it, some people say it takes more energy in than they actually get energy out of the power plant there. Because they're pumping sewage water to get their water. They pump sewage water from Santa Rosa up into the hills, up in the, in the geothermal fields. That's a tremendous amount of energy to move that water. Then they have to inject the water, they, they have all kinds of overhead costs. I mean, in the, in the end, would you be better off just using natural gas than to go after that with these complicated systems? Now in the Great Basin, five kilometers down, the temperature is uh, 200 degrees centigrade and above throughout the entire Great Basin. Right. Yeah, it's like Tesla said, inexhaustible. Can we go back to the, yeah. Yeah, th that says it all, inexhaustible. Unlike the peak oil thing, which is supposedly. How deep do you typically have to drill to get to a sufficiently high temperature? You have to go down quite a ways. That's what Tesla said was the, the limiting factor. 
So all that, he said all that is necessary to open up unlimited re reserves of power is to find a cheap and easy way of drilling deep shafts. That's what the rest of that says that you can't see there. How many feet do you have to go to the earth? Thousands. I mean, but the, the, the great thing about the, uh, the salt brine is you don't have to go that far and you hit these pressure zones and it comes right out of the ground under high pressure. Only problem is it's full of salt brine. So to, to make a system like this work, you have to have these deep, deep shafts to find the temperature. But if, if you've got something like the Salton Sea, where you can go down at a considerably less, you know, shallower and, and hit a, a high pressure geyser coming out of the ground that gives you enough pressure to operate the turbine and enough thermal, but just not, an, but it's just full of salt brine. Now you can capture that energy. That's the, that's the potential. Automobiles, good question. Am I have control here? I don't have control. There we go. No, other, this is a mem man. Okay, well back to our membership manual. And you'll see there's a diagram in here for the uh, Volvo. Oops. Man, man one, okay. Okay, here we go. Automobiles. Back, remember, remember back when the state of California was trying to enforce a 2% mandate that all cars that were sold in California had a 2% of their your sales had to be zero emission vehicles. Everybody remember that? They totally abandoned it. But the car companies were concerned that they weren't going to be able to meet that mandate. Everybody started coming out with electric cars. That was the heyday of electrics. Well, Volvo came out with a car to meet that mandate called the Volvo ECC, or Environmental Concept Car. Anybody remember the ECC? Excellent car. Volvo took the opposite tact of most hybrids. Instead of using a very small compact frame for their hybrid or inventing some new frame for their hybrid vehicle like the, like the Prius, what Volvo did is they took their largest frame vehicle and converted it to a hybrid. And you say, well, that kind of counterintuitive, right? We're supposed to be increasing our mileage and here you are taking your largest frame vehicle and converting it to a hybrid. How can that make any sense? Nobody else can do that. How come Volvo could do it? The reason Volvo could do it is because they use the Tesla system. Volvo is the only hybrid manufacturer that I'm aware of that has actually used the Tesla hybrid scheme. Tesla was all in favor. As a matter of fact, Tesla invented the hybrid. In 1900, when he announced the hybrid, he was assailed as a fool. How can you generate power in an engine, put it into an electronic transmission, and then put it to the wheels and expect to have higher efficiency? You're a fool. He was actually lambasted in all the technical publications. So, the so Tesla is the inventor of the hybrid. He was 1900, he announced it to the world. He said we could go coast to coast on a single tank of fuel. How do you do that with a full-size car? Well, what Volvo did, if you can see the diagram here, they have the AC induction motor. That's the standard AC induction three-phase Tesla motor. That's connected to the wheels. So the output shaft, you have a, each one of the front wheels has a motor. So there's two of these motors, each one on the front axles of the car. Okay? Then the AC induction motor is controlled by an electronic frequency drive, a modern transistorized drive control. And this is what I did for years. I specialized in electronic controls and drives. That's my background with Rockwell Automation. But the uh, incorporated the bladed turbine, see here is a bladed turbine, and the bladed turbine is going at high speed, and that drives a Tesla high frequency alternator. Okay? The only part of this system that is not Tesla's is the turbine. It says they developed a bladed turbine for this device. This is where they did their only real money spending is they developed a specialized 
small bladed turbine that could go into the car. Conventional. Okay? And they also filled the thing up with batteries because it had to be zero emissions. When it was in town, you had to be zero emissions. So you shut the turbine down and you turn on the batteries. So instead of the power coming from the high frequency alternator, it comes directly from the batteries into the power supply and runs the motors. This was shown at all the car shows. Excellent engineering. Volvo really did a nice job. Okay, only problem with their turbine, why didn't it sell? What, what happened to the mileage? That, that full-size car got like 21 miles to the gallon at 55 miles per gallon. What do you think they did with the fuel mileage? Even though they doubled the weight, they stuck all these batteries and they had to beef up the suspension because they doubled the weight. They doubled it. It's full of NICADs. What, what happened to the mileage? It went up to 45 miles per gallon at 55 miles per hour. So they essentially, they doubled the mileage even though they doubled the weight. How'd they do that? And by employing the Tesla system, hybrid system. So guess what? Tesla was no fool. He had to endure it all, but he had a thick hide. Okay, what was the problem that Volvo had with their car? Why didn't it go on to commercial production? Well, California dropped their mandate for one, but the other one is that bladed turbine. What do we know about bladed turbines? How can you have a bladed turbine in a car? They're fragile devices. You have to have good safety. They can fly apart. One of those blades comes loose, ouch, goes right through the housing, somebody's dead, right? The other problem is they're expensive. They're trem tremendously expensive. You, it's not practical for a car to put a, to put a bladed turbine in a car. It doesn't make any sense economically. So that, anything that's not economic ain't gonna fly, right? So it's done. Okay, so here's the solution. Let's take that bladed gas turbine out, and what do we replace it with? A cheap, Tesla said the veriest of novices could work on this thing. If the turbine overspeeds, guess what happens? The discs grow, contact the outer housing, and you have a disc brake that slows it down. You can't overspeed. Okay, it's the only turbine that's, we didn't really talk much about this, but it's the only turbine that self-regulates its speed to applied pressure. On a bladed turbine, you take away the load and you keep the pressure on, what happens? It runs away, it explodes, boom! On a Tesla turbine, you apply pressure and take away the load, what happens? It regulates its speed to the applied pressure, much like a DC motor applies, regulates its speed to an applied voltage, same concept. So it's just head and shoulders above. We have the solution for the hybrid car. Now, if Volvo wouldn't have been taken over by Ford, maybe we had a chance. <laughs> but anyway, that's the end of the lecture. We're out of time. So we have any time for additional questions? Uh, yeah. Uh, actually, you've got, uh, it looks like, about almost five minutes uh, at five. your discretion. OK. Uh, and uh, if we can, we'd like to get the questions on uh, on the radio, or, I mean, or at least on the mic. So I uh, tell you what, for this question and answer session, how about if we have individuals just come up here and line up to the right here and uh, stand, stay, just come right here and just take the mic. Uh, and by the way, while you're coming up to ask questions, uh, we need to express a special note of appreciation for Jeffrey Hayes. You noted the, you noted the schedule change. He was thrown in the deep end of the pool or as fat in the fire. And this man, flexible and thinking on his feet, recovered. And those of you who have presented before know how much preparation you have to do. This man did something that nobody's done yet in the shortest amount of time. Thank you, Jeffrey. A question for you. Question. Is it possible to apply this idea to uh, jet uh, aircraft propulsion as well? Question, question is, could we apply this to jet? Jet propulsion. Matter of fact, this engine was developed for aircraft. When, when, te and when the Wright brothers came out with the first uh, aircraft at the turn of the century, Tesla had always imagined that aircraft would be electrically driven, and he was trying to figure out a way to send wireless power, which, which has been done since Tesla, to operate an aircraft. But he, he realized that there had been major advances made in internal combustion engines but they were complicated and, 
and he considered them a, 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 night, a mechanical nightmare. So at, after the Wright brothers flew, and, his, and they, had, they had beat him out on flight, he wanted to be the first man to fly. He thought he would be. But the Wright brothers beat him, so then, and he, they beat him with an engine, and that's when he turned his attention to engines. And that's what started it all. And this was originally intended to, to power aircraft. Yes, an excellent aircraft engine. Yeah. Uh, the thickness of the blade have any effect on it? Does and and uh, who makes the pump that pumps cement, the Tesla okay. pump? Can we get the man up, uh, two up? The, the question is, who makes the commercial units? It's a company called Discflow, D-I-S-C-F-L-O, discflow.com. And they pump cement. They, they can pump cement, okay. yeah. The, you can pump, you can, the really nice thing about the oil industry is they, they can pump fluids that would normally boil inside the pump because the pump draws a vacuum and the, they have high vapor pressure materials that, and it destroys the pump almost immediately. This is the only pump that can pump high vapor pressures without damage. The of the oh, the thick, another question, does the thickness of the disc matter? As long as you have enough physical integrity to, get, to maintain stiffness, they don't have to be thick. They can be very, very thin. Is that the pump? Yes, there's a, there's, if we can go to the back of the manual. Oh, which one? This, which, which, which one do you want? Oh, this is, this is Mem Mem 1. Okay. We want Mem Mem 2. Excuse me? I will give you okay, we got, I've got photographs of the commercial pump we can bring up. Okay, here's, here's Mem Mem 2. Okay, you, what, question about flight? There's the patent for flight. Tesla did the first, the VTO, the v, vertical takeoff and landing patent. That was Tesla's patent. He's the father of the vertical takeoff and landing. His aircraft was to be vertical takeoff and landing. There's two turbines in it. There's, there's props that one, there's two props. One prop writes, uh, goes clockwise, other goes, that's not shown here, but they're right here. It would be two propellers. One goes clockwise, other goes counterclockwise. To, to, and there's two turbines. One goes clockwise and counterclockwise. And, a shaft within a shaft that drives them. So Tesla was the father of the vertical takeoff aircraft. This was 1928. Matter of fact, there was a plaque in the Sarkors Sarkorsky helicopter. Sarkorsky gave Tesla full credit for the helicopter. Okay. Okay, there we go. Here's the commercial pump. And you notice there's a cutaway. Case has been cut away. And the suction comes in center goes out the periphery. Notice there's just a three, three very st stout disc in this application. They make them in various forms for submersible. Here's all the disc packs, all these different varieties of, of spacing. Depending upon what you want to pump, if you want to pump something that's very big, then you got to take the spacing apart. And notice that one right there has very th wide spacing. Then another one like that one has a very thin spacing. Depends on what you want to pump. And here's the, all the performance curves for various RPMs. It's all been mapped out, parts lists. All the <coughs> details are in the manual. And here's uh, all the advantages, non-impinging, non-pulsating, non-clogging, little to no shearing little to no maintenance, little to no downtime. Here's a list of everything that can pump easily. Things that a conventional pump couldn't touch is no problem for this pump. So that's pretty much the tour on the pumping. Oh, uh, another, another thing you might, might want to know about Aerojet. Built a little one inch. Aerojet is a military defense contractor. They built a little one-inch multi-stage Tesla pump, three stages, and they were able to attain, what does it say there? 24,000 foot head, 10,000 PSI, 15 gallons per minute, 140,000 RPM. So even though it's one inch, it still works. Okay. Okay, we've got time for about two quick questions, and then we're done. Okay, two more questions. Perhaps I missed it, but what turns the turbine in the automobile engine? Oh, what, what drive? What's the fuel? What drives the turbine? Unleaded gasoline. That's what Volvo was using, unleaded gasoline. Standard fuel. 
But the, the good question, because the beauty about this turbine is you're not limited to clean fuels. The same reason you can run dirty geothermal, you can run bunker fuel. I don't know if anybody knows what bunker fuel is, the lowest dredges of refinery. Finding, they take and they, they run it in diesels and ships out to sea because it's such a disaster. Uh, they run it in South America in the buses. You see these big black plumes of smoke. That's the lowest grade of diesel called bunker fuel. And they try to keep it on ships out to sea, but it's causing a huge pollution problem. Matter of fact, the ships that come into San Diego Harbor, they figure half the pollution in San Diego is a result of ships coming in that are running bunker fuel. Tesla turbine can run bunker fuel, but it burns it all completely clean. So it, we can use the lowest dredges of the refiners in this thing. Here we go. One time oh. for one more. Yeah, sorry. Um, if the Department of Energy or, or maybe a private investment or finance company was going to put together like a scale model prototype, just as a proof of concept, right, for the, the salt brine slurry we're talking about, what do you think that would be as like a minimum cost just to produce, I don't know, 1,000 watts or 10,000 watts or whatever it takes to demonstrate the concept? It would be depending if the government's involved or not. But yeah, I'm just wondering what the ballpark A private figure. individual could do it for, you know, tens of thousands. If the government was involved, probably tens of millions. Oh, okay. So th <laughs> what this would be within their project funding scope, though, for, for that kind of stuff. It's strange the way that works. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I guess that's it. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Does Jeffrey Thanks. Hayes... Uh, Okay, we're going to take about a quick half-hour lunch. Uh, I'm sorry that it can't be uh, more than that.